Radio Free America, and this is Uncle Sam with Music and the Truth Until Dawn. Right now, I've got a few words for some of our brothers and sisters in the occupied zone. The chair is against the wall. The chair is against the wall. John has a long mustache. John has a long mustache. It's 12 o'clock, Americans, another day closer to victory. And for all of you out there on or behind the lines, this is your song. <laughs> Welcome everybody to Every Second Matters, uh, June or July 2019, kind of slash uh, two-way media workshop. So uh, since the day that we do the workshop falls on the second of the month this month, we're going to do two chats in one, and uh, we've got uh, links out there to a whole bunch of people that are in two-way media, be in the middle of the afternoon or late afternoon, depending on what part of the country you're in, we'll see who can has the chance to jump in. But one of our goals today is to build a tool to facilitate that going forward. Uh, we've got a couple of things we're going to talk about, but this is uh, an, a, an awareness campaign, and it's an effort to get together on the second day of each month to keep a conversation going about the rights that are protected by our Second Amendment. And uh, the workshop is designed to... Uh, facilitate collaboration and sharing of knowledge and skill set for two-way media people that are helping to get the word out and uh, working together to uh, uh, raise awareness on this stuff. So um, appreciate everybody who joins us each month. Uh, this is a campaign. It's nothing to join, really. Uh, it's just uh, deciding to be part of it. And uh, we have a couple of people joining in uh, from the email I sent out that has a link in an email. Night strike. Uh, so, Dead Horse, jumping in from Utah. Thanks for joining. Howdy. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for jumping in. And Rick, jumping in from Indiana. Thanks for joining. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. I appreciate both of you guys. Both of you are putting in a lot of effort over on our gunchannels.com community. So, Gun Channels is about as old as Every Second Matters, a little younger. Um, and it's a community for conversations like this one, a place for people who are either creating content uh, focused on firearms and Second Amendment, or people that enjoy watching created content, not uh, produced content. And uh, we appreciate everybody who joins us on the Gun Channel side. Uh, we have a text chat over there, and we're following along with whoever might be uh, interacting with the show. The thing about the internet is uh, this: you use the internet. You have a voice out there. You have influence. You have ability to, uh, to meter the shows and to um, like and share and have influence on uh, how, how 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 much reach uh, projects will get. So there's so many levels that you can be involved, and we appreciate the people that join in the conversations and the text chats. Of course, uh, the tool we're using for these is YouTube right now. It's actually a pretty nice tool for conversations like this one. It allows 10 people to join in and have a pretty seamless uh, conference call type environment. We can sh share screens on our computers that we're on, or if we're on a phone, we can use the cameras. Of course, we have webcams. So there's quite a few uh, resources we have here. But after all, it's a tool. It's on a platform, which is a tool. So um, uh, we're paying attention to the text chat out there, but we're always looking forward at the next thing. And, and like anything, strategically, we want to be aware of when a tool might no longer be available, which we suspect that might happen at some point in the future with the Hangout tool here. So uh, while well, I appreciate the people that join us on YouTube, let's remember that this is the internet and we're stronger when we have more abilities, right? We have more skill set. So with that, Clover jumped in from the email that I sent out to everybody. Uh, thanks for joining. Hey, thanks for the invite. Well, I'm a little late. I know where he's just started. I got. I keep getting harassed out there by Nightstrike right? who claims to have the link. I'll send him the link manually. Oops, that's the wrong button. Uh, anyway, I got a couple of things that you guys saw in the email to chat about today. Uh, we're getting closer and closer to the Gun Rights Policy Conference coming up in September, and uh, there's a link in the description to this video. Uh, so if you're able to, if you're at all inclined uh, to participate in uh, the Gun Rights Policy Conference to show up and be in Phoenix, then uh, um, please consider it. It's September uh, 21st, I guess, 22nd, 20th, 20, 20th to technically the night of the Friday to the uh, Sunday. Uh, the um, two-way media, I forgot what they 
Coffee Amcon though is the day before. So uh, if you can, if you're creating content uh, or you're interested in seeing what it's like to be part of that, I don't know. If I'm, I don't know if there's a requirement to be doing media, uh, content, but I suspect if you're going to the Gun Rights Policy Conference, you're not going to mind if you attend the Amcon as well. You can register for both of those still. We have links in the description of this video, and I'll post them in the text chats as well. Uh, but uh, we have just a little over 60 days now uh, to get ready and plan trips and, and organize as a bunch of uh, people that are active uh, before we get to that room together and uh, see whatever opportunities we've got. So uh, nice strike jumped in from South Carolina. Thanks for joining. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And uh, I don't know if you just see. I'm always hesitant. I send out that email and it goes out to a whole bunch of people blind copied. I so didn't you, get it. Yeah, so I don't know if it gets filtered or what. But uh, um, anyway, if uh, you're interested in joining, let us know on the gun channel side or uh, let one of the people who are in here know. And it is, of course, during the day, but uh, we got to do what we got to do. So there's no perfect time to do anything. Anyhow, without uh, getting too distracted with all that, thanks everybody for showing up, both on the panel here and uh, on the on the tech sites. And uh, we'll run this for as long as possible, uh, as long as there's interest and as long as we have people in conversation. There's no need to uh, beat a dead horse, as so to speak. And uh, um, we got plenty to talk about, I think. So we've got the Gun Rights Policy Conference on the schedule to talk about. We've got AMCON on the schedule to talk about. I mentioned both of those, but we can elaborate on those as much as anyone would like to. Uh, we'd also, I'd also like to accomplish a task today, and that is to come up with a nice, uh, complete as possible schedule of all the different two-way podcasts that are going on. Uh, we have that schedule over on Gun Channels, and ideally it was, well, at least for a while, it's the idea was that when you uh, are posting a show on gun channels, you just go over there and you edit it yourself to make sure everybody knows about it. But uh, I'm thinking we can expand that to have some of the other podcasts that are going on, like Liberty Doll on Fridays and Tony Simons. Uh, those are going on. They're not necessarily posted on gun channels, but people might be interested in them. The radio show, Come and Talk It, that uh, Yoder posts on Sundays, those kind of things, we might as well put in the schedule. So, uh, you know, there's no. Anyway, so I'd like to work on that today. Uh, and then this concept of Medcalf's Law. Uh, we talked about that on the Daily Gun Show yesterday, but I think that's interesting and a bunch more people in here, we could uh, elaborate on that. Uh, I guess a couple other things are um, low cost and free photo imaging software. Um, I got an email from Adobe telling me that my subscription was going to increase, that they were going to uh, take me from whatever to we're going to you know, add more cost to my plan. And uh, I don't have a budget for that. So um, I attempted using some uh, non-Adobe products before or some alternatives before. And the issues were when you use a software package that has proprietary files like Adobe, uh, if, those, if the free versions or the inexpensive versions can't open your old existing files, then that's that's a handicap, right? That doesn't, that really puts you back if you have to redo a lot of stuff. So um, there are some alternatives that can open Adobe files and seem to work really well. I happened to watch a couple of videos as I was surfing. So it's not something that uh, I necessarily, somehow the internet knew, right? It must have understood I got that email or something because it threw a couple of these suggested videos in front of me and it, I clicked on them. And uh, they were pretty succinct and uh, brief, well, fairly brief videos on some of the alternatives. So I figured we'd talk about that. And uh, anybody who wants to bring any topics, this is a busy time. We've got a lot of stuff happening, and I'm not going to suggest that I'm paying attention to it all. So uh, this is Every Second Matters, and thanks, everybody, for showing up. Uh, I'll shut up and let everybody chat a bit. Or dead air, you know, whatever. And just get into the yeah, I'll just get into the get into the mute button there. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't. Heck, I don't know what. I mean, the uh, the whole gun rights policy conference thing. Um, you know, I would like to actually talk about that probably a little bit. Um, that's something that I've I've been working on. Um, you know, definitely have plans on being there. 
it, um, it's one of the things I it looks like I'll be making that trip by myself. Uh, and unfortunately, I haven't been able to make contact with anybody in Texas that potentially we could partner up, split a rental, you know, do something like that. And really, you know, I've been putting feelers out and asking people, are you going, are you going, are you going to potentially get a house, split a room, you know, do some things like that. And, um, yeah, it doesn't seem like, you know, a lot of, a lot of people are going. So you've been quite a few times before, G. So what, um, does it seem like there's a lot of folks that kind of do what we do that, do you make that, or is it? Oh no, I've only I've been to three, and I've watched like more. So, uh-huh. um, you know, the cover. I can't say that I've watched three because the coverage has varied. But you know, uh-huh. understanding having been there, you know, I kind of can get a feel from uh, what's going on in the background, maybe, or the vibe in the room, or the noise in the room, or something. I can, you uh-huh. know, kind of figure that you know they've been pretty consistent. Uh, right. Did you mean like as far as two A media content creators? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. No, non-existent. Uh, for a while, there was none. And then, you know, I started showing up and bringing my stuff. That was probably in 10. And, uh, um, I mean, you know, there was other people there. There was radio shows or something there. CNN's been there. Or C-SPAN, I think, um, right. has been there. So they're not unfamiliar with having cameras. And Charles Heller's been running the audio and then recording the entire audio and all the different versions of tech throughout the years he's accomplished to like get that out almost immediately either in originally in cd-rom form and then well i think even originally before that something else and then cd-rom form that you had to wait and you know get a cd in the mail for free and then eventually now you can i think you can just well i think for a while you were going up and getting thumb drives and then now it's uh just you know has it available on download but um the audio has always been available through Charles, who runs the board. But then, you know, podcasting or the the live stream really, I guess, started in in the back in the day. And I would do I've, I've streamed them off my devices, you know, from the room with you know just as an audience member, not like off the board or anything. Uh, mm-hmm. But then the Plate Society podcast started picking up in like, well, they were there in ten, but I don't know how they weren't a an established big channel or anything. They just didn't, you know, they weren't at the level they're at now. Um, but right. then I think in 12 or something, whenever they went to Florida is when they started like officially streaming it. So they'll officially stream it, but it's in Facebook. So, okay. you know, uh, so then they took over quote unquote, the social media. So as I started attending in 10, wait, was it no, in, uh, 1817 in Dallas. Right. And that first Amcon, you know, okay. I streamed that live just off my laptop rogue because they weren't streaming it except for on Facebook or I didn't even think they were streaming the, the, the Amcon and uh, Patriot and those and a bunch of other people were in there listening live. And, uh, and then I think that was apparent that, uh, you know, the, the level of, or the, not the level, but the type of two a media that attends Amcon. So it's uh, authors. It's a couple of pod. Well, okay, in seventeen, it was no podcasters. It was people who were either authors or bloggers, um, but nothing with with YouTube at all, really. And then, and it was a it was definitely a workshop in Dallas. And then last year, it was completely different. And they did have a couple of well, at least it was not a workshop so much as a seminar in in Chicago. But then. Uh, they did have a couple of bloggers who mentioned some things, but I think this year they're making it more like a an interactive workshop where you'll a, a workshop as opposed to a seminar, maybe where they'll they'll talk. I think is what's we'll look at it here in a minute, but I think they said they're going to talk and then have an open discussion or something, so you can uh, get some back and forth. So they had people that were there, but they weren't covering it, and then it, there was def- certainly no call out that I'm aware of that like either like, hey, you're able to or you're encouraged to stream, share, or anything like that. Um, at least nothing more than like a cursory, like, thanks for sharing this or something. You know, nothing deliberate, nothing strategic for damn sure, and, uh, and nothing 
in what would be like all encompassing. No, like deliberate, let's bring the best tweeters in here and sit here. Let's bring the best Instagrammers in and give them a seat here. Let's bring the best YouTubers in and give them a seat here and here. Now let's get bloggers in and give them a seat here, right? So nothing like that. I don't know. You know, we have, I don't know, that has not been approached. It doesn't, I don't know what their ambition is or interest is and all that. So I don't know if that answers the question. And then as far as just attendees, no. I mean, I don't know of anybody on YouTube. This is not interesting. It's a it's a it's a income killer. Uh, it's a downer uh, to your audience. You know all the the pessimistic stuff. So it's just not appealing, and there's been no interest at all. This year, it sounds like there might be some interest in in established big time YouTubers showing up. Mm -hmm. A couple, right? Well, that's you know I don't know. That was kind of my. You know, I guess that was my question is I've kind of been putting it out there and this just seems like most that are, you know, in this space do this thing, you know, whatever, podcast videos, whatever. It's just not something that they're plan on doing. You know what I mean? And um I don't know, that's in a way that's frustrating. Yeah, frustrating, but who cares? You know what? Locomotives only drive on tracks. That's frustrating, I guess, but I don't care. So, um, you know, it leaves, leaves them over where we know they're going to be, right? We can use them for what they're for, and we don't expect nothing else out of them. So I'm just coming up with that on the fly because I've been listening to uh, this author guy, and I'm going to go try to figure him out. But have you heard of this thing? One of the other topics today is Medcast Law. Uh, no, I don't guess. It Anybody doesn't else? sound familiar. Anybody else heard of that? I have not. I have not. So I'm going to go over to Instagram here and I'll screen share. Uh, one of the dudes that chats on, uh, Matt's chats on Wednesdays and sometimes on Mondays. And then uh, I got to meet up with him when he still lived in Pitt in Pennsylvania when I was heading out to see the, uh, the castle in New York. Um, he's been getting in shape and stuff and he does these challenges with the... Uh, you know, various places he's dealing with or the coaches or whatever you want to call it for his, like, you know, motivation to get in shape and all that. So part of it is part of those challenges have been to read books and stuff. And he posts about that. So I bugged him about uh, posting some of the book lists because I'm curious always to see what kind of books people are reading when they're trying to improve their self, right? Um, Self-help books, business books, motivation, all those are interesting because you can learn from what other people do. Uh, that can work into your system or routine or project, right? So, um, one of the pro one of the books he mentions this thing called Purple Cow by Seth Godin. Godin, everybody heard of this one before? That book, no, I guess. Nope. <clears throat> so nope. I searched for it to see if I could find an audio book of it, right? By going audio book like this, and sometimes you can just go to videos and look at the times. And, you know, if it says like six hours or four hours, that might be the full audio book. In this case, all you get for this particular thing is a whole bunch of descriptions of it or chapters, brief summaries or something like that. So I'm just going to dig into YouTube. So now I'm not searching Google anymore. I'm only in YouTube. And then I'm just going to search for the exact same thing and see if anything comes up in YouTube. Because sometimes Google's trying to look at too much stuff. But then and again, you don't find anything. Uh, I won't bother to search for it, but you don't find this particular book on audiobook at all. But there's tons of these. This is that this bald guy is him, the author. There's tons of these other things, right, that he's um, done or whatever. So here's a two hour one. So that might not be his audiobook, but that's like a two hour talk with him and some other guy. So I think. So um, sometimes you can find some pretty interesting stuff to listen to, even if you don't find the specific book you're looking for. So in this case, I guess I can't tell from like where my previous links were, but somewhere in here, um, probably the oh here this I did, I did there is an audio book. So there's this one called "We Are All Weird" by the same guy, and it's a two hour and fifteen minute audio book. So you can I don't think I'm allowed to tell you what to do with that link and where to click it or anything, but you can listen to this on YouTube all you want, and it doesn't even look like if there's any ads in it. Like a lot of times there's little yellow blips every couple of minutes that are annoying. Um, anyhow, so I found some stuff from this guy just listening to maybe a 20 minute talk or maybe one of these kind of things like this where he talks about um, another topic, not this cow book, 
and he's sort of a branding versus logo. I think that's his gig. So, or his his take on whatever the speech she was talking about that I was listening to. And he had some pretty interesting stuff um, to talk about as far as like a business coach or a, um, yeah, I guess you'd call it like a business coach or a, 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 fin a business strategist. And uh, he's an interesting guy because it sounds like he's made his money. He's done and he's now just an, advi like an advisor. He's not even a consultant. He doesn't do things according to him. He doesn't um, put himself out as a consultant anymore. He's just doing his thing and offering advice and he publishes once in a while. So his thing, though, uh, getting back to what Clover was talking about with the frustration of the big guys not doing whatever, um, I don't think there's any point. Who cares what the big whatever do, right? There's got to be big bloggers that don't do nothing, right? There's big whatever reviewers that ain't going to do nothing. There's big entertainers that ain't going to do nothing. Who cares? Because this guy's whole thing is the concept of, um, we've talked about it in other chats before, but the idea of the few motivated versus the when you look at a bell curve, the few motivated at the beginning on whatever the topic might be, and then you got that big gap in the middle, right? And the only people that are going to appeal to that big part in the middle of a bell curve are the plain vanilla established stuff who are following the lead of whoever is digging in. And his whole thing is that, especially with today and the way that we've got, uh, you know, the, the crowdfunding and the Patreon, which we're going to talk about here in a second, and the 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 kickstarters and the indiegogos and stuff you don't need to appeal to everybody you can in his whole book about being weird you can stay weird you can be specific you can be on your topic that you're passionate about and you know use resources that are available to bring people in and and that's where i think I'm, i was digging that whole concept i want to listen to more about this guy's stuff but um for us uh if we each if we each are doing our own thing let's say and uh in having this conversation with our, our own audiences uh, and then to some extent aware of each other and as Clover would say having bridges to other and, and their conversations and their audiences and their uh, areas of interest that's where we're, we are strongest right that's like having a bunch of bricks that work together as a system and are stronger than any you know pile of rocks maybe I'm using a great analogy there but you know is that you know to answer the frustration that you know, the ones with the momentum and the ones that have the numbers and the ones that have the attention, you know, we can't steer them or we can't force them to change. But what we can do is do our thing and motivate the numbers that need are needed to keep us going and to um, be persistent in the ears of the representatives, you know, affect change. It only takes 3% of people to affect change on political issues for the most part, right? Not 11% maybe for big stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. Anyway, I've been chatting for a bit, so um, I'm going to go get some water. And what do you think of that whole concept? Uh, oh, we haven't even talked about the concept or whatever, but that's where I got the concept of um, Metcalf's Law. Did anybody was anybody around last night when I talk talk about it? No, I was not. Well, I wasn't either. No. Let me see if I can just find something that will explain it. I think I had a little robot that explained it yesterday. Oh no, here's an interesting one. I'm gonna get copyrighted on this one. Here, Night Strike, why don't you give us about a minute and 54 seconds about what you think Metcalf's Law is all about, Night Strike. Acceleration of hardware, which I, I have no idea. I have no idea what it's about. I wanna know. Five yeah, years shut up, so. you're, you're so okay. Uh, hacks. The other law though that interests me now is Metcalf's Law. And that's Bob Metcalf, who, among other things, helped invent Ethernet. And about eight years ago, Bob postulated that the value of a network grows as a square of the number of people attached to it. So in other words, it's another exponential growth. And that, I think, is what has really potentiated the last 10 years, the way Facebook went from 12 million 11 years ago to 2 billion today, classic. Metcalf's Law at work. And what's interesting about Metcalf's Law is it allows newcomers into the marketplace to really even bring down regulated industries because if they grow so quickly. Classic example here in New York City is Uber. About three summers ago, uh, the number of Uber cars in New York got to be as large as the number of yellow cabs. The yellow cab lobby, quite influential in New York City politics, went to the mayor and said, you got to do something about this Uber thing. 
the mayor actually said, okay, we're going to put a cap on the number of Uber cars allowed. But by that time, Uber was already so entrenched, had such a powerful network of users and drivers that they orchestrated this amazing PR campaign, all focused on the mayor, who came out a couple weeks later and said he had actually misspoken about the Uber thing. What we're going to do is study it. Now, there's five times as many Uber vehicles in New York City as there are yellow cabs, and the yellow cab industry is just shaking its head. How did they get run over by this thing? So, I don't know, I'm going to grab an image that'll kind of sum it up. The very common image that you see from Midcap Slot is this. To the new tab. So, basically, if you've got just a couple of phones, you know, you got two one one way you know whatever communication and then you got five it turns into 18 or whatever that is and then when you got a whole bunch it turns into like 52 and that's that you know the power of network and i thought there might be something since we're talking about keeping a conversation going where you know is this a visual representation of what we're trying to uh, keep going with every second matters Sorry, <laughs> sorry, get to the get to the mute button. No, I mean, yeah, I think so. That was, you know, the the theory. I guess the theory is with with everyone you bring on, it it feeds on itself at a at a certain rate. Is that I'm not quite understanding the the theory there. Oh, it's just the. Let me go back to that picture. It's just, well, you saw the picture, right? Or did you? I can't. I can't see the picture. I'm on mobile right now. Oh, let me go back to it. Um, basically, if you got two telephones, there's one line between them. But if you got five telephones, you got a line between each. You got the ring of them, but then you've got all the cross connections. Oh, okay, I got you. And then as soon as you go to 10, sixteen phones or whatever it is, fifteen phones, then you've got like fifty something connections in between. Oh, nice, Drake mm -hmm. just threw it up on his on his screen. So, something like this, right? Yeah, that's basically the diagram they usually use, and it's just the idea that you've got so much more potential, I guess, for reach. Uh, with uh, with a network with you know a bunch of people involved, sure. you don't need one you don't need one entity that's that large when you can have you know, pieces that make it up. And then I guess okay, big deal. But what you know, how can we know that and use that this cycle around? You know, how can we use that to our advantage instead of just having people that went to college for this pummeling on us with all their resources all the time? Because there's people who go to college for this stuff. This is just marketing, higher level marketing stuff, right? Like just the you know, awareness of how trends mm -hmm. are. Right. Right. <clears throat> well, I guess the key to it is actually making those connections, right? Yeah, I think so. Or or encouraging or yeah. encouraging people to make those connections, right? Because it's not we're not talking about you have to make the connections. If you can encourage somebody that you know to make connections, then it's one of them things where by proxy, I guess, right? You have those connections as well. Is that more like what we're talking about? I don't know. I mean, it's not like I had something to talk about other than use it as a stimulus right. for conversation. But I think yeah, right. I'd, I'd rather go back to what you're talking about. I don't know where you're going with that, but your thing about bridges or whatever is, well, uh, I mean, it's a very similar. It sounds to me like it's a very similar concept. No, that's what I'm saying. So if you've got, we go, well, nice strike. Throw that picture back up, if you would. So you've got the the two phones, and they're connected, and you got as much power as you got when you two have two people talking to each other. But mm -hmm. now, if you've got, and let's say that's two different points of view. Now you got five people in there with a whole bunch of points of view, right? And mm -hmm. you've got a much bigger area. You got much more potential, I guess. I don't know much more reach or something. Uh, so then you get to that bigger one. And like I say, it depends on how you're looking at Metcalf's Law. Sometimes you'll look at it as like a marketing thing. Sometimes you look at it as a um, technological, like, you know, just an internet networking thing. Because there's some of this has to do with the machines that you know, there's just a lot of ways that this law would apply to, you know, various characteristics of communications with people. But we're just looking at it on the surface, not, not any of the tech stuff or any of this, even the platforms or anything. But I guess when I look at those, that simple diagram, um, go back to it again, I strike. I guess I'll just go find it again. Um, I mean, I, I've got it. That's just, just the diagram, right? 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that when you've got the um, the big, I don't know, right here. when you got the group there at the bottom, the larger, even if the one with just the five or whatever, you don't have to fiddle with it. Just leave it there. All right. So, all right. Them. so um, you don't have to think of those as individuals, right? If you've got those telephones represent entities, a writer, a blogger, a radio show host, whatever, right? Them connecting is is bigger reach connecting, right? Because then they bring others with them. So I don't even know if it needs to be a radio show host and a blogger need to connect if there's someone else who can step in and be the mortar between the bricks, right? What we're trying to accomplish is build a, a net, I guess. So if you look at that, I don't know how you're, you know, again, there's multiple ways to interpret this, but if you look at that first one, you're only going to catch whatever happens across that one line you've got there. Pretty difficult for two people to accomplish too much unless you're really strategic about where you are able to get that message you've got. With five, mm -hmm. it becomes a little easier, but there's still lots of holes in there. And obviously, as you get more complex, it becomes a more close to a solid thing where it's almost impossible. So anyway, right. just... Well, right. You remember, the, the telephones are just an example. What? The telephones are just an example. You could use a computer there or a server there or something, and it would still have the same meaning because it's just a different way of communicating. It works. It's kind of like a spider web effect. In a way, right? That's what, kind of what I'm seeing with it. I'm able to see that picture now. Or a, or a net, or casting a net, right? Because I've used that. I've used that example before um, when talking about you know YouTube channels and when people get into well, you know, I don't know what my niche should be or the you know subject matter or what I should do my videos on and we talk about um, you know the difference between you know people say a wide net but instead of a wide net think about it as how big the holes in the net are right so if you've got a net that's got smaller holes you're going to catch a lot more stuff than if you have got a net with big huge holes in it so same type principle, I think, with that. Correct? Oh, no, I'm muted. I, I don't, it's, again, it's not like a, um, a correct answer or something. It's just a, a splotch, like a whatever test, right? It's just a thing to get conversation going. Um, I think it's a lot like the 80-20 uh, principle. It's just one of these, it's like Moore's Law, right? The, the idea that Technology is going to increase or whatever on exponent or whatever that rate was. Um, it's a similar one. It's just a it's a, a Constant that you can apply to again marketing or networking or networks uh, Telephones computers like Night strike was saying, you know, it's a it's multi it'll work on multiple levels, I guess Right, right. So the law itself is um, again Let's see. So it says, for example, two people with telephones can only make one connection. Five telephones can make 10 connections, and 12 telephones can make 66 connections. So it's famously known as Metcalfe's Law. So in other words, if you've got a, um, a community with two people, it's only going to be able to get that much influence. With five, you know, it can grow or whatever. I think that's one way of looking at it. And when you have more members, you know, it can get to more nuanced view or something. Anyway, there's a specific um, equation to it because it it's just math, right? It's just as the more entities you put on there, the more complex it's going to get, and the number is going to start to grow as a, a square. So then the question is, how do we use this? Is that what yeah. you were... Yeah, like I say, this is really just kind of a, sort of like the Moore's Law, like sort of a tech thing, mm -hmm. like, hey, at some point a network's going to get so complex that, you know, it has a finite, or it has to, you know, reach as a tech value. There's so many ways to look at this, but, um, yeah, how do we apply it to the concept of 2A media, who are potentially a bunch of entities, and, you know, I guess, you know, how do we apply it to us? Yeah. A lot of it is just reaching out and awareness, you know? There's a lot of people that are I know, I'll, I'll use Liberty Doll as an example. Um, more than willing to help, more than willing to 
be a part of the, the the fight and what's going on, but they're just not the type of people. They're kind of in their own bubble, in their own sphere, in a way, and you, you just have you have to reach out, you know, and you know for us you have to reach out and not be afraid to get banned or blocked, which sometimes happens because the person you reach out to is just an absolute butthole and doesn't want to have that conversation or takes whatever you're trying to ask the wrong way or thinks that you're weird or whatever the case may be. Um, you know, or, you know, they never get back with you, you know, or whatever. Um, there's a lot of things that you have to deal with when you're, branching out, networking, you know, trying to talk to people. But, you know, I go back to the thing that, you know, not only branch out to people and say, hey, you know, would you like to work with me on this project? Or, hey, you know, have any interest in helping with this particular project or whatever, but also encourage them to, you know, work with other people that are maybe doing similar things they are. Say, hey, you know, are you aware of this person? You know, so this person is doing, you know, similar content with you or stuff along a similar line, similar topic, um, similar flow, that sort of thing. You know, do you know about them? And, and if they don't, you know, then try to, you know, be the operator, I guess, in the little diagram you were <laughs> kind of showing there. You know, help them make, make that connection. That's one more connection to the, to the web, even though that's not, you know, not one I'm willing to make. It's like, hey, I'm not really into what this particular person does but I see the value in what they do and so what I need to do is I need to you know I don't have any interest of collabing with them or doing anything with them or working on a project with them um, but you know I do know some people that would and so you know let's let's work to make that connection happen another way to look at it is you know you've got a couple of things and you've got pretty um, you got an ability to control the conversation because there's only two sides of the conversation. When you get to five, it's still possible to be aware of the conversations, right? The, to be everyone to be aware of the conversation that happens or the results of a conversation or a collaboration. When you get to too many, um, it becomes staggering how many potential variables there are, right? So maybe again, when we start looking at the traditional more, 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 bigger, 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 growth, growth, growth. Um, you know, a, a more an, an alternative uh, focus or strategy would be get to a, a, a what's the word like the uh, the ideal size and 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 you know find what pieces are necessary and then have uh, efficient smaller sized units than trying to have a giant, a giant thing that appeals to everybody or. I mean, it's real. It's it's unrealistic to to expect wherever. I mean, the NRA can't get everybody online. If aside from all the issues, you know, if there's just no way for everyone to agree on everything, is it wasting our time to even try? So maybe this is an illustration that, you know, of the of the difficulty and the ineffectiveness, even when you get a lot of people together, unless they're complete lockstep to, like you say, some kind of coordinator. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm not going to try to get blood out of the stone here. So we're going to talk about the AMCON. So we talked about that briefly at the beginning of the show. It's a gun rights policy conference coming up in September. And the day before, the gun rights policy conference is a Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday event. So the Friday before, uh, during the day, is the AMCON. This will be its third event. You can register at the link that I uh, posted in the description of the video, and I'll be posting as I speak. That's how the internet works when it's live, right? We can do stuff immediately. So, um, Flight Society Podcast and Self Defense Radio Network and the Second Amendment Foundation are proud to host the third annual Alternative Mass Media Conventions, AMCON 2019 workshop. We are responsible for so much of the information that the Second Amendment community receives. We must hold ourselves to a higher standard than that of the local and national media. So, we have set aside a full day that we will be dedicated to. A full day that will be dedicated to podcasters, bloggers, YouTube creators, and anyone else in the new media that has a connection to the Second Amendment community. Our event goals are to offer top industry speakers that will help improve the effectiveness of our media through our attendees. 
Okay, so the goal is to offer industry speakers, right? They're going to improve the effectiveness of the media through the attendees. So the attendees are going there to improve their skills, right? And their networking, same thing like AD did at his uh, train and learn event. Similar goals there. So some of the bullet points here offer guidance on how to better connect with their consumers, viewers maybe, improve journalism with fact checking and why it's important to get it right the first time. Um, advise the effectiveness of new technology and products available to the Second Amendment media. Oh no, sorry, advice on the effectiveness of new tech and project products available to the 2A media. Interview techniques, investigative journalism for the citizen journalist, monetizing your media, uh, turning the consumers of media into activists, that's a worthy goal, roundtable discussions, and that's new for the third year here. Actually, a lot of this stuff is new. Uh, so then it goes on to say, sharing info, info among our guests, guests will strengthen their resources and will help build a solid connection with their consumer. Uh, our attendees' reach of their combined product is in the tens of millions. Continuing education is a vital part of any industry, and AMCON is taking the lead on Second Amendment new media education. The workshop will take place on Friday, September 20th, which just so happens to be the day before the Gun Rights Policy Conference in Phoenix, Arizona. So there's no excuse not to attend since a large number of new media will attend the same venue. Remember, we are responsible. And then uh, you can click, where's the link? Oh, I guess I already registered maybe. So, or no, you click on this link and it takes you to this Eventbrite thing that's just like some sort of a re re reservation system or something. And it's free and you're gonna get fed. So, uh, lots of, I guess they don't have a, a list of speakers or anything right now, but uh, you can see they're gonna cover a bunch of uh, or, you know, strive for a bunch of good goals, decent goals. Oh, maybe they are going to talk about speakers over here. Are they going to be ready to? Looks like there's going to be registration. Then there's going to be a welcome and opening remarks. And they'll post the rest of it later. And it's in Phoenix, Arizona. Does it say where in Phoenix is going to be? Do have they got a location yet? Yeah, same place as the Gun Rights Policy Conference at the Sheridan Crescent. Okay. Which is on 2620 West Dunlop Avenue, Phoenix. So would you say you get more out of more out of AMCON or more out of GRPC? They're different things. Gun Rights Policy Conference oh, okay. is, you know, the gun the gun owners rights groups are gonna take the stage and they're gonna talk about what's up and what they need and what they can what they see in the future going to get uh, focus groups and, and different areas of interest that get up and, and do the same. And then you've got a room, well, last year it was about 300 people. So a room that can hold 400 people will be filled with, halfway filled with 300 people-ish and uh, or something like that. And then you'll get a pile of books and stuff. So it's, uh, it's drinking from a fire hose of info on all kinds of stuff. And then... Uh, and, and that's a conference, so you're basically absorbing all that. Uh, there's very little interaction. It's just observing and, and you know, ideally archiving or, or streaming that. Uh, but then, you know, the, the AMCON is, as a content creator, I mean, it's hard to say. What's, that's why they're together, right, so that you don't have to make a decision. But uh, the AMCON is certainly, you know, the, the, it's only third year and they're growing, so it's the opportunity to... To meet with others that are not just similar minded but motivated enough to be in phoenix right and then mm -hmm. very much like kevin's event um you know you've got a relationship with them you've got a, a shared adventure and and then all the knowledge that's going to come up it sounds like they're going to do workshops and stuff you know there's going to be a lot of knowledge there and uh and then just of course to be in in a room is inspiring and being in a room with uh, people that are again motivated and and already established and you know have accomplished you know it's a it's in a great environment and it's free so you can't be free well it doesn't cost free to get there but free to be there the air 15 builders united on facebook needs your help the page is not about the latest arrow lower it's about uniting as firearms owners that's cool not much of a Facebook person, but 
I'm sure there's people here. If you want to uh, let us know, you can drop a link. Honda saying networks have hubs. Uh, GU and gun channels are a hub uh, for the distribution of information. Sure, everybody's a hub, right? So that's, I guess, one way of looking at that um, uh, diagram that for Moore's Law is, uh, yeah, you know, do you consider yourself an observer of all that or do you consider yourself on little telephones, right? And right. that's where I think I was going is one way to look at that too is that you don't need to have uh, Yankee and Pincus like each other. Yankee and Jaeger don't need to like each other. Yankee's going to be Yankee. You know? and I guess you could debate whether that has value or not, but he's certainly going to be Yankee. And uh, when needed, you don't only need to stand next to two people playing tug of war, right? And the other side has a machine on the other side, a bunch of Terminator robots funded by Bloomberg money. And uh, we're going to bicker about who's holding the same rope as us? That doesn't make any sense, right? I'm not going to bicker. So anyway, you can become, like what Clover would say, a bridge, but maybe another way to say is like a mortar in the bricks. If you've got these established bricks that are out there doing their thing, you know, they don't have to be the same rock. They don't have to be anywhere near each other on the same wall. Uh, maybe we can be those little telephones in between, or everybody can be those little telephones in between. Absolutely. Um, Honda saying there are nodes and hubs in a network, three degrees of separation. Content creators are in a way hubs, and users are in a way nodes, but with gun channels, you're the hub, and the creators are the nodes. Hold on. Hold on a little bit. Content creators are hubs. Okay, so hubs basically take information in like a like a octopus for the or a wall ward or whatever you want to call like a power strip. Uh, they're going to take power from one plug and distribute it to six. Right? They're going to distribute. They're going to share. They're going to amplify. So yeah, we're we're if anything we're routers or or switches, right? Uh, as content creators. But then I suppose there's content creators that would be uh, I don't know more influential than that. Is that what he's trying to say? Nodes. Nodes don't do anything, right? Nodes are just big old junction boxes, right? That allow two big copper yeah. wires to pass through each other. But I believe so, yeah. We're just playing with analogies there. So anyway, that was uh, Ampcon. And it seems like I'm nodes of the end users. Okay. I don't know. And then in, in, in 2019, do are we satisfied as end users? That's ridiculous to me. That isn't that part of the goals of Amcon? Uh, where is it at? Turning your con the consumers of media into activists. I don't like that word consumers. I guess you are consuming it, but you're viewing it also, right? So turning the viewers of media into activists doesn't that empower us all when we realize that we're not watching television or reading a magazine anymore, where all we can do is turn it off or yell at it or change the channel or put down the magazine or unsubscribe you know now we have likes and shares we have tools that are made for kids to fiddle with their thumbs on phones and they can have influence so can anyone be content as just a viewer anymore or that's a decision at least right that's just up to the individual person i guess sure but it yep. definitely makes them think, right? It, it it might promote it. It might make them think differently about things. I think we're definitely in a a day and age where, you know, there's really there's really no excuse. You know, there's no excuse for not turning out the vote. There's no excuse for not getting, you know, comments during a comment period. There's no excuse when you're talking about you know, flooding a particular politician's office with letters or, you know, there's no excuse for being ignorant of things that are going on. You know, we really are in an information age. And, you know, the, the problem I think that we face is that too many, too many are leery, I think, of tech. I think that is a problem. I think that will go away. Uh, or it won't go away. I think that will... I think the ratio of that will get smaller as time goes on because you've got people, uh, quite a few people now that didn't grow up with stuff like that, right? So, um, you know, we're kind of in that, you know, we're a generation, uh, even speaking from my generation, that really didn't have, you know, there were certainly computers and stuff around growing up, and I used them in school, but it was, you know, 
lines of code and stuff like that. It was not, you know, it was word processing type stuff. Uh, certainly wasn't the internet. Certainly wasn't something with, you know, information at your fingertips. So I think that as the younger generations get older and more generations come on board, I think that, um, I think we're in the infancy of it. And I think you're going to see more and more people. I mean, look at people like Project Veritas, and I hate to throw them out there, but um, some of these, quote, citizen journalists, right? Is. What is that? Well, Project Veritas is the guy that runs around with the, yeah, he's got famous, James O'Keefe, I think was his name, but got famous with uh, exposing Planned Parenthood mainly, but, you know, runs around with the hidden cameras and stuff all the time. And basically, he was a dude that just decided he was going to go places, turn a camera on, and then upload that crap to the internet. <laughs> you know, and now they're kind of... Oh, is he like with the kind of the hidden camera talking to like the Democrat campaign about their weird disinformation stuff and all that? Too? Yeah, yeah. And he's talked to several people. The whole, I think the whole, if you heard the Van Jones comment about the nothing burger or whatever, uh, that was him. And then most recently, he got like some Google employees, supposedly, or something, uh, and sat down with him in a coffee shop. And they didn't know he was who he was. And he got them on camera saying a bunch of things about um, the political biases, you know, within Google and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And I'm not, I don't bring him up, you know, for an ideological argument or anything like that. I just bring him up that he was a dude that literally like turned on a camera. But look at, you know, look at somebody like Nuance, bro, who I know you're a fan of, you know, um, just goes out and turns on a camera, <laughs> you know, uh, and I think you're going to see, you're, you're going to see more and more. I, I know in the last couple of years, I've seen tons of people do it and it, it's exhilarating in a way because I think in the future, they'll, you know, there won't be, I don't know, it's weird because when the country was founded, the press was something that was sort of separate of the people, right, at the time, because we needed that, and we needed a good press. You know, we needed a good press that, that were, you know, were held to standards and, and practiced good standards because, you know, it took weeks and or months sometimes to get information from point A to point B, right? I know you're not sure if you're, because when I think of the free press, I think of the brochures, the pamphlets that started the revolution, and that was the mm -hmm. alternative to the established, like, you have to be so high to enter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? So. Well, but it, but it, it, I guess what I'm talking about, you're right in that sense. But once the, you know, you've got, they talk about the separation of powers, and then they talk about the press being able to help, help you know, hold everything accountable, you know, everybody accountable. And, that was sort of required because it kept the citizens on the same page. But as we move forward, we're at a, we're at a day in the, in the, in the quote unquote presses, I think is seeing this. And that's where you see a lot of this panic um, is uh, they, they're no longer needed because <laughs> the citizens themselves are able to much like you're talking about. And that's where I was going with that G much like you're talking about in pre Revolutionary War times, the citizens are sort of able now to, in a way, write their own, write and distribute their own pamphlets and their own stuff, right? So it's almost like like media has technology aside. It's like media, the idea of press and media has reverted in a way to what it was pre-Revolutionary War. Where everything is just guesses and nothing is true. Don't everyone speak up at once? Oh, I'm muted here. So I was being muted. So you're talking like the free market nature of it, um, but I'm saying like the the technological end of course is is massive. So now we can you know, talk to each other individually or a group um, you know across the country where they didn't have that ability before yeah I mean the the technology like I said the, I'm talking about the foundational aspect of it 
um, with the individual aspect, the individual person can very easily now with technology, you know, be far, far more effective than the, than the guy writing the pamphlets out, you know, whatever, uh, pre-revolutionary war times. So, but that's something that's, that's, that's something that is, that we, we're seeing now, which the process, I guess, behind it or whatever, is the same. And that's sort of exciting. It's sort of exciting to see the people sort of taking over as the press. It's like, okay, we don't need this quote-unquote watchdog. And, and most of us understand that this watchdog has screwed us over repeatedly <laughs> through the years uh, because of agendas and whatever the case may be. They're also a smaller body, so they're more able to be manipulated by governments, politicians, you know, influ outside influence of, of um, you know, whatever you want to call it. But the people as citizen journalists are, that's, that's a whole lot different um, situation. It's, it's really hard to control that. And, and that's why you see such a scramble with, oh, you know, we've got to big platforms and we've got to take this stuff off these big platforms and that stuff. And then the government coming in and going, oh, but we need oversight on this. Well, you know, you want oversight so you can basically do what citizen journalism the same thing you've done to mainstream journalism, <laughs> which is co-opted. Um, but yeah, it's, it's still either way. It's exciting to know that, you know, the average person first time right out of the gate can write an article, post it and potentially get hundreds, if not thousands of people instantaneously to see whatever that information is. All right, Ghost jumped in here from Arkansas. We're just solving Second Amendment. Uh, if you would just solve it for us real quick. Yeah, uh, I'm going to borrow a line from Nice Strike. Shall not be infringed. Shall not be infringed. You're getting like four words. Thou shalt not be infringed. No, it's, no actually, actually, I, I believe the old expression was, thou shalt not be infringed. All right, so some of the topics today are the Gun Rights Policy Conference coming up in just days in September, September 20th in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, then we've got AMCON the Friday before. Then we've got, um, we're going to go through and update the podcast schedule here. And we've been talking about Medcalf's Law, for networks uh, stronger than voices. And then um, the topic we haven't talked about yet is alternative, either free or low-cost image software. Um, so anybody wants to grab in any of those and run? Or any topics you might have that are two-way media. I'm not going to be... I'm not going to be any good probably on the free, low-cost image software because I don't know in all my years that I've ever used anything that was... Uh, free or low cost, but I was fixing to before Night Strike jumped in and said, I bet you Night Strike knows. Uh, as far as uh, image editing, yeah, I use uh, GIMP. It's like Photoshop, but it's free. Well, it's open source, so, but, it, but you can download it for free, so it is free-ish. It's, it's got a learning curve, but uh, it's a decent program if you need something like Photoshop, but you don't want to have to spend a subscription for Photoshop. That's all I got. You can get anything for free if you look hard enough. Yeah, but this time. this is legally free. Oh, okay. okay. Well, well even so, usually you can... That's that's holds true even legally. Uh, if you look hard enough, you can find free. the The only drawback to free, you know, you get what you pay for. Uh, sometimes is limitations. Yep. Yeah, you can. Um, I mean, technically, 
I know I don't do this, but I know that there are people that will do like a free, let's say 30 day trial for Photoshop, put their email address and into 30 days, they'll create another email address. And, you know, so, I mean, if you're willing or able to have an infinitive, you know, amount of email addresses, you could technically be working on a trial. Like, but like Clover said, um, those are going to have limitations. I have never used GIMP. I know a lot of people that do use it, and I've never heard anything bad about it. I think, like even Nightstrike said, there's a learning curve, but there's a learning curve for everything. If you know, when you start using a, a Photoshop or a G, I think you use uh, Adobe, was it Premiere or, so, or whatever, one of the other Adobe ones, there's going to be a learning curve for any program. But if you can find one that can get the job done, I mean, uh, like I said, I, from what I understand, I heard GIMP's pretty good. Yeah, it, it, it works. I mean, yes, it doesn't work exactly like Photoshop, and it does things a little different than Photoshop. But at the end of the day, if you need to edit an image or if you need to, you know, make a picture for your website or whatnot, you can do so using GIMP, and, you know, it'll it'll have just the same effect as if you had used Photoshop. Yes, it'll be a little diff different on how you accomplish the goal, but the end goal is the same as if you had paid for Photoshop used photoshop so, so photoshop. i'm on oh sorry g go ahead no go ahead i was just saying i'm online right now and i just typed in free photoshop alternative number one is gimp and you guys let me know if you've used any of these. i haven't used any of these number two is inkscape number three is pixlr uh, i've used or, inkscape and number four is like krita k-r-i-t-a and number five is canva I've never heard of any of them, but I mean, a lot of these are, are browser based um, uh, Inkscape software. Inkscape is primarily which is great. used for, for, for vector type images. So if you need to do a lot of vector images, you'd use Inkscape. Canva is just a free online. And while they say it's free, it's, it's paywalled. So I'm not a very big fan of Canva. But, uh, Inkscape and GIMP are probably two of the best uh, open source slash free image manipulation software there are on the internet right now. So uh, I got an email from Adobe that they're increasing my rate or whatever, and I'm not digging paying for a subscription anyway. They have turned off old copies of Adobe, so there's not options for everything anymore anyway. But um, it's powerful software. It has a lot of pieces that I don't use, though. And uh, there's certain things that I do need. And those, from doing, watching a couple of reviews, um, can be accomplished through low-cost or free softwares out there. Um, one of the problems with the big softwares, like Adobe and probably others, is they have uh, multiple pieces because they're doing a lot of stuff for you. And... I'm not gonna, I mean, I use them. I, they are great software. They do what they're supposed to do. The way they accomplish that is with big pieces. So they, they take a lot of your machine, a lot of hard drive space on the computer, a lot of RAM when they're running. And uh, sometimes they'll run all the time just to keep their large pieces up to date and um, uh, so that when you use them, you don't have to wait around or anything. So uh, those can have advantages and drawbacks, depending on how you use your computer and what you value out of the resources your computer can offer. So as uh, I said, uh, they told me they're going to up the, the subscription rate, so I've been looking. There's quite a few. YouTube is a great resource for finding edit, uh, any kind of tech, uh, software, hardware, reviews, and um, discussions or comparisons, I guess. So uh, one of the people that I uh, had a problem with Adobe and uh, decided to leave Adobe. I uh, used uh, Illustrator, and like Nightstrike said, the Photoshop is for raster images. If you think of an image like this purple swatch on the screen, that can either be created on the computer as a bunch of purple dots, or it can be created on the computer as a mathematical equation that creates that shape. And a raster image is a bunch of purple dots. That's more emulating a, a photograph with an, uh, on film with a negative and the different things you could do in a dark room uh, to, to work with that negative and the exposures and the um, brushes and things are all very um, realistic and uh, detailed oriented 
um, drawings and they come out as JPEGs basically they come out as raster images uh, for large and small for machine codes for things that are going to look more logo ish than photograph ish uh, you use vectors is another type of file and that again it uses instead of a bunch of circle a bunch of dots to represent a circle that are in the shape of a circle it uses a mathematical equation for a circle and the end result as far as the software itself and as far as um, the, the files when you're done you don't notice any difference I mean using Photoshop and using Adobe Illustrator is basically the same they, they come from different sources so their tool bars are different but the pieces that you use, what you accomplish with those tools, the end result, you can't hardly tell if an image came from Photoshop or from uh, Illustrator uh, or the comparable files on whatever other platform. You know, there's different things. There's besides Adobe, right? There's, um, what's the other big one? I uh, can't think of the other big one, not Sony. Um, but anyway, there's a couple other big ones and they'll have suites or they'll have software packages and. They'll do Adobe, I mean, they'll do vectors, and they'll do... Paint Shop Pro still around? Eh, that's not the one I was thinking of. Corel, I was thinking of Corel. Corel, yeah, yeah. Corel, yeah. But, um, so anyway, so when I'm thinking about not using Adobe, I think about the um, the, the uh, Illustrator files, the, re the vector images that I've got, and you'd have the same issues with changing from Photoshop. If all your files are saved in Photoshop format, which is what, PSD? then, uh, you know, those editable files that you might need to go back and change. You know, you might have a, a logo that you update and you go into that editable file and you change a little thing and then you save it as a new version or, a, you know, the, this year or, you know, whatever increment you're changing on it. Uh, if you've got a whole bunch of resource like that, uh, content that you've created that's got editable versions and you can't open it in your new software, that's a big problem, right? That's a big well, hindrance. That's why I mentioned GIMP, because GIMP has some backwards compatibility with uh, PSD files and Photoshop files. So, you know, if you made it if you made it in Photoshop and you tried and open open that PSD in GIMP, you should be able to, you know, get work your way around and continue using it. Okay. So there is some there's some backwards compatibility. It's not perfect because remember open source compared to paying out the yeah, hard to call open source backwards compatibility to one of the largest like a billion dollar software package but you could say cross compatibility and I, I, I guess cross compatibility would be a better term yeah but it, so, it you can open PSD files you can even export as PSD files as well so uh, it, it is something to look into if you want to try and switch over to that Okay, if you're quick selling GIMP, can I talk about the two that are on my screen that I'm trying to get to? So okay. you guys talked about Inkscape, and that is a free version, and I've used it. It's okay. Uh, it, it can open an AI file, an Adobe Illustrator file, uh, not easily. You have to fiddle with it a little bit. You have to change the extension on your file before it'll be able to open. Uh, but once you install it, it's very small compared to uh, Adobe, and uh, it was just as powerful for the things that I ever did with it. Uh, so I'd highly recommend it if you want a free option. Like Night Strike said, it's open source, right? So it's being developed by the people that use it, that are nerding out in how to use it and looking for new things and figuring out how to adapt it. And it'll come out with new additions periodically uh, for free. So that's something that as long as a user base uses it and appreciates it, more than likely it'll stick around. It, there's always a potential. Somebody will come along and buy it, I guess, if that's possible. I don't know, is that, is that one of these things, or is this not, you know, some of these things are structured where they really can't be bought, they're, they're too open, but uh, for the most part, I think we've got a lot of open source stuff that's established now, uh, but like anything, when you've got just a collaboration of loosely knit individuals who work towards the same goal, there's nothing, there's no actual glue, like contracts holding them together, so if everybody just starts to walk away, it falls apart. So investing in a, heavily in an open source is always a bit of a risk, a bit of a gamble. Uh, but the larger established ones are less of a gamble, I guess. Uh, and then there's this new one I've just heard about is called Affinity. So it's got a couple of versions to it. It looks like uh, when you click on it, it's got a photo version, which I'm guessing is like a Photoshop version. Uh, and then you got a designer version and then a publisher version. And again, going after those um, items from uh, other platforms or other companies 
and I don't know if it'll show you on the screen. When you go to buy it, they're like 40 bucks. So uh, you buy them, but you, know, you pay an actual dollar, and that's not that much. So um, I don't know. I've heard good stuff about this one. It'll import, and it's just as powerful. So has anybody heard of Affinity yet? I have not, no. I or have not. Photo. Now, the thing that they don't have is video, right? So it would be nice if they had a video, but this is more graphic. Um, so we'll talk about video in a different one, because if you get rid of the Adobe Suite, then that means you're getting rid of Premiere also. And that's the reason I use Suite. I really like Illustrator, but Adobe Premiere is awesome. Isn't that what you use, Ghost? What's that? Don't you use Premiere for your video editing? Or do you use no, I use uh, CyberLink Power Director. Oh, okay. You, you have uh, Premiere, though. I don't you? have, well, I mean, I, I don't, I have After Effects, and I've got Adobe Audition um, and Photoshop, but I haven't done the Premiere side thing yet because I just, I've always used CyberLink Power Director. So I'm just one of those people that once I kind of got something down, I don't change it unless I have to. Yeah, there was restrictions on it, so I was looking for more, and uh, I'm going to dig into some of these. I don't know, like say, uh, they're when you talk about these subscription services, you know, it's a, it's a chipping away. It's not the money, it's the principle to some extent, and then when you look back at a year, you're like, yeah, it kind of was the money, <laughs> you know, when, it, when, it, when you have to go back and look at it for taxes or whatever, you're like, wow, that was a lot of money for that software. I mean, you can do things with it, but... Uh, I don't know. So uh, overall, y'all are mostly using free versions of software then? Uh, no, I mean, I bought PowerDirector, and, and I, I upgraded, I don't know, about a year or so ago, maybe a year and a half, whenever it was that PowerDirector 16 came out. And <clears throat> I wouldn't have done that because uh, PowerDirector 16 versus 15 uses a lot more, I mean, a lot less RAM. It's, it's a lot less um, power consuming on the on the PC when you're using it, um, but but if, if it hadn't done that, then I would have probably stayed with you know I, I've bought all the programs, but I haven't gone to like the Creative Cloud yet, so I'm still using like an older Photoshop before the cloud came up. It's not cloud based. See, and that's the other reason I like the Adobe is because with the cloud, so with this cloud subscription, you get uh, their whole suite. You get everything. And they have a bunch of little stuff, but then some pretty major things. Photoshop, Illustrator, and Premiere are their vector, raster, and video editors. But then you get uh, Dreamweaver. I don't know if Clover ever used Dreamweaver back in the day. but uh, I, don't use I used it. But um, you also get uh, the cartoon thing. Uh, there's a couple of three or four elements to the cartoon, the animation suite. And that's just super powerful. And you can make those little puppets and stuff. I think there's some super potential there. But... Um, Again, if you're not using it all, then you're just paying for you know, potential. You can always get a subscription later for that stuff. But the, the 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 size of Adobe is impressive. But there's again, you, I don't know how many people actually use as much stuff as it's on there. Yeah, I. Uh, oh. oh, go go ahead, Ghost. Go ahead, man. Go ahead. Oh wait. Well, like Ghost, I, I also use uh, pa uh, Power Director, but I use 13 because uh, they did give it away for free at one point, and that's how I got it. But uh, I also use OpenShot, which is one of those open source ones as well. But uh, yeah, I didn't I, it. it glitched on me. I wanted to try that one before I went to Adobe. Yeah. I couldn't get it to work. Has it been working for you? It's been working. It's been working fine. You might have just gotten a bad install. That's, that's all I can say out on that one, but uh, it, it it is a little harder to use than Power Director, and I like Power Director Director because it's easier for effects. So the effects in OpenShot are a little harder to use, and I only use the easy ones because um, I'll be honest, I'm lazy when I'm editing. So, but uh, you know, I, I'd like to see if we could try and find any, you know, because you mentioned the, the the Adobe Animator, right? I'd like to see if we could find some sort of animating program that's open source. That would be fun. Yeah, 
Hey, G, I've got a question for you. Um, and there might be other people out there that might be thinking the same thing, but with the cloud-based um, Adobe suite, and I know that the cloud, I think, was supposed to give you more and easier storage, but it's also probably to help relieve some of the um, the consumption of hard drives. But when they're running, do when you have those the, with the, when you have that suite, the Adobe suite, whatever, is it is it a lot of RAM being used when it's when it's running, or has the cloud helped that out as well? Oh no 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 no! Cloud is just it's totally different. It, I don't think it's even designed to do either of those two things. There are software packages that claim that, that put your processing up on the cloud. So you're just interfacing as a terminal to the server up there. And there are some that are like that and they have gotten good reviews too. Um, but then the cloud on Adobe is less for that because you still, it is very resource intensive in your hard drive and your RAM when you're running it. And when you're not running it, it's basically bloatware because it's huge software it needs to be updated or at least it updates regularly uh, so that um, you know when a large software updates it's going to be large updates so they try to do those all the time so that you're not waiting for them you know when if you only had them update when you use the software and you'll use the software once a week but it's updating every day you might wait to use the software it might say please wait while we update nobody wants to do that as the end user so well, I don't like it, but when software packages leave those TSRs running, software running that basically says, oh, there's an update, let me update that. You're watching YouTube right now, you'll never know. Just take some of your resource and you know, upload, updates your software. So, yeah, it's huge in all, in all ways. But the cloud gives you the ability to, um, to put your stuff up there, not so much for storage, but alternative storage, RAID storage, so that you've got it online because you're going to use multiple devices, right? So you've got maybe multiple laptops or a laptop and tablet and phone. You've got the apps on all these different devices. Now you're sharing. So it's just a, a, an ease in sharing. Now, if you're collaborating, it allows you to do that too. You can cl uh, collaborate on files or share resources, you know, elements from files that can be in libraries that can be shared. So that's where the cloud is super useful and collaboration and that kind of thing. And that's where I think there might be some potential too. Uh, that answered the question, I'll dig into another one. Uh, when this guy I was watching was doing some reviews, he mentioned a cloud-based um, vector, because I was only looking at Adobe replacements. He mentioned a cloud-based vector software that was collaborative, that was designed to have teams use the projects. And that seems really su super interesting when it's open source, so it's you know not cost anything if we're talking about potentially in these workshops and in other efforts bringing people who aren't familiar with the internet or with electronic communications or with you know deliberate networking or whatever if we're bringing people together traditionally we've brought people together in these hangouts but if we can use some of these other tools to bring people together inside a software instead of a social network how empowering is that if what we're kicking out after a discussion like this isn't just bunch of blab 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 that recorded and a bunch of people texting blab 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 you know in addition we could be doing a, a poster or a handout and at the end you download this thing and print it out at your local gun shop and it's a call to action maybe with the OBS and everything um, and you know in a collaboration type of environment software maybe uh, we could have chats evolve into that where we build stuff in these chats, digital stuff. That's, we, that's an interesting concept. I like that idea. We could all throw pieces of videos together and build them online in a shared software. If that, something like that exists, we're talking mm -hmm. about video, or we're talking mostly image, I guess today. But you know, in the future chat, we could talk about uh, video, uh, what cloud-based video potential editing. You know, I'm, I'm sure that that's already at least to a certain extent possible to do. It might not be perfected and there might not be anyone utilizing it, but I think that that is, especially with even not even with, you know, media creation, just with offices, you get people in these large corporations that are worldwide corporations and they have a huge, you know, uh, meeting that had a presentation. They got people all over the world working on the same project. Let's say it's a video or a 
slideshow or PowerPoint, having that cloud-based media creation would be an interesting thing to help streamline business as well. Oh, like pulling teeth. So I uh, appreciate you guys jumping in, but uh, I don't know. So is it, you guys are all not using free software. Um, any software that you don't have that you're looking at getting or acquiring or thinking about using? Specifically, no, but I've been looking into um, not only image front, but, you know, on uh, facilitation of live stream been looking at some of that stuff and potentially would have to pay, you know, like the Adobe or whatever, you know, had to pay a, a monthly fee on that sort of stuff. I've been looking at in the OBS to run through YouTube uh, live if uh, Hangouts does indeed, in fact, go away in such a way that, you know, we either have to pay too much money for it or, or whatnot, because some things are still unclear about that. So... I've been just kind of looking at that a little bit, see what's involved. Pretty clear, so. pretty clear at this point. You know, we we know for pretty much a fact the free is going to go away. Yeah, I've been looking at getting software for uh, some of the other projects I'm working on. I can't say which ones, but uh, the larger projects. So. I've been using a, and we talked about it on on different chats. We use Clovers After Hours or something, but I use a free uh, software, and it's media creation. I use it for everything. Uh, for I use a virtual mixer. Um, it's a free software called Voice Meter, and if people are looking to get into podcasting or whatever, it's a free software that uh, you can just download and use it as an actual mixer. I don't know if Honda's still listening. He was not able to jump in because he's doing stuff. But in case he's listening later or something, he's talking about getting a voice recorder for when he goes through Dragon Man's next week. Do you guys have any suggestions for a digital voice recorder for him? Your cell phone and headphones. There's every every cell phone's got a, a voice recorder on it. If not, you can download a free app on any cell phone you want and put a microphone or a lot, you know, or whatever a headset in there. And I love they're great, a lavalier, but uh, yeah, I mean, your phone, you shouldn't have to go out and buy anything. Your phone is as powerful as any voice recorder you're going to have. That's what I told him. I personally don't have any experience in digital voice recorders. I think Clover does, and I think you do, G, but... I just use, I've always used my phone, so I, I couldn't help them as to what voice recorder to get. I, I'm I'm ignorant in those situations. Yeah, I mean, if you're wanting a, a voice recorder, um, I don't know. I mean, I've never been on a tour with Dragon Man, so I've got to I got to think that the people going on the tour are probably fairly quiet, so probably not a lot of background noise and stuff like that. Uh, G can probably speak to that because he's been through that, I think. Um, so you got to look at things like that and then how far away when Dragon Man's talking, I mean about how far away is he going to be from you. Uh, it's going to make a big difference. So you, <clears throat> you might want uh, something like a shotgun, a little shotgun mic or something you can plug into your phone, spend the money on that little shotgun mic, uh, that way you can kind of point it toward him while he's, he's speaking and be able to pick up the audio better that way. Um, as far as a voice recorder, heck, I would have to hit up the Googles and look because I've got one that's that's okay. It's one of them weird ones that look kind of like a, oh, heck, looks kind of like a Star Trek tricorder or something. It's got the weird little angled microphones coming off the end. I don't use it that much because uh, the phone is just too easy to use. Now, if you're gonna, if he's doing it specifically for Dragon Man, and gee, you've met him, you've been around him. I don't, I don't know him, but I can't imagine that if you walk up to him and say, "Hey, before we start the tour, 
can I put this lavalier mark mic on your shirt and have you put this in your pocket and just have him mic'd up as he's walking around talking? I, I don't, I can't imagine he'd be against that, would he? No, he seems like the kind of dude that would totally do that. He'd make, you know, jokes and stuff, but he would do it. Yeah, that would be a that would be an awesome way to do it. You get real quality audio that way. Yeah, his would be really clear, and then you could sync it up with your video if you you know another phone or a voice recorder in his pocket with a lavalier mic, and then you're walking around videoing. You can sync up that audio for your video, and it's going to be as professional sounding as you can get. One thing I'd recommend is that uh, maybe asking him to repeat the questions because he, whether he's mic'd up or not, if it's some question from like some other person back in the crowd you might not pick up that question but you'll just hear his answer to it right and uh so unless someone's there saying like after the fact or before the fact oh the question was and then you kind of know more of like what he was actually talking about or what you know the basis of that answer that he's given that, 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 what's that g i think that would be tougher to get dragon man to do he just or just do it yourself, you know, like after you answer something and you're walking to the next thing, then just remind yourself of the, the question. Yeah, and then you, can, so you, then you can use your video editing, and on the video, you can just type in the text what the question was while he's answering it so people can see the question. Yeah. They don't have to hear the question, but you could, like you said, the question was this, and when you sync it up, you can type in the question so it's on the video while he's answering. I think that's a great idea. Because personally, that's just one bug thing that bugs me about things like that is like you'll hear people talking about stuff and answering stuff, but you don't even know what they're really answering or what that answer relates to necessarily. It's not always obvious. Then you're like, well, like, why did he say that? Like, what, what was, what was he getting at there? Because he never heard the question. Yeah, that's the. Um... When, I, when I'm at SHOT Show or NRA or something, you know, if there is a question that I'm in a, a booth interviewing somebody and for some reason the mic doesn't pick it up clearly or something, I've had to before type the question on the screen just because the question through the microphone wasn't audible because it was so loud or something was going on in the background. Yeah, I mean, there's always different ways, but yeah, you're right. One of the frustrating things, if anything, is, is if someone's answering a question but no one knows what the, you know, what the question was, then... You know, doesn't do anything, doesn't do any good if you don't know what was actually asked. So that's a great point. Okay, it took me a minute, but now I found uh, videos that were from days before Gun Rights Policy Conference last year at Dragon Man. So you can get an idea of what the tour is like and what the audio level is like. Uh, this might be. So you see how far away I am from them there and how... Wait, wait, this is my question. This is a 1944-year-old motorcycle. It's just like a BMW, but not, not like a regular motorcycle. It doesn't have a chain or a sprocket in the back. That's good audio, pretty good audio for that kind of distance. Plus, with all the people, it's pretty quiet in there, too. Like you say, they're pretty much listening because you want to hear what he's saying, right? Yeah, that's not bad. Yeah, it'd be, that'd be really cool if you could mic him up. Yeah, that, that was just kind of a thought. I mean, I, I can't imagine. I mean, it, you know, the initial thing is him mic being mic'd up, but I'm assuming he's just like anybody else. Once he starts talking, the last thing in his mind is the lavalier mic that's attached to his shirt. So you're going to get great audio. And, I mean, that's the best way to go if, if you have – an, an additional phone or something you could like you said a voice recorder or whatever just do that and then splice the audios with the video and now you've got a really professional looking and sounding video i'll play this last one but i have to suggest i have to let you know that it's uh if you're a board owner uh snowflake warning they got an order from the u.s government to dodge brothers to make one thousand of these the serial number is 147. This is one of 1,000, and it still runs. All the stuff I don't use for a long time, see, I jack it up so it doesn't distort the wooden spokes or the tires. Uh, after my veterans party, uh, November 11th, 
uh, me and my son and uh, all my helpers, we start everything up. We, go, we take the batteries out, we cover everything up. All the gas tanks have to be filled to the very top, or else you get compensation in there, we get pinhole, you know, the gas tank. So they didn't have a, a fuel pump back then, so the gas tanks had to be hired in the carburetor. There was no batteries, so they had to crank it, see the crank in the front. And this is what one of the first Dodge motors looked like. It's only 28 horsepower. See that? And they have magnetos. Those are primers on the top. You prime it with gas, close the butterfly, it'll create compression, hit the magneto switch, and they start. Uh, every year, four or five cranks, and the thing starts right up. If it was a Ford, it wouldn't have lasted this long. <laughs> but uh, it doesn't have any uh, juice brakes or anything. It's got mechanical brakes on the back, and the big brake shoes, they squeeze the brake drop instead of expanding. Yeah? Okay, this flag here, it's got 45 stars. The 45th state is Utah, Colorado, 38. There's Colorado, 38 stars. That was made, uh, that's 121 years old. It was made 1897, 121 years old. All these flags, almost all these old flags, I get from other museums around the United States that are going out of business. You ever see a 13-star flag? South Carolina, right there. 13 stars. There you go, nice, right? All six of those flags there came from a uh, museum. Right. In they told me those flags been behind glass for over 50 years. I have over 4,000 flags in a museum and over 5,000 helmets. Made in 1917. They got an order from the U.S. That's a little taste of Dragon Man and the audio. And, uh, yeah, like you say, there's different rooms, that, but they're all kind of that big. You get kind of that auditorium sound, but uh, not a lot of echo. No, the audio sounds really good, actually. And and I, and I think that Clover might be crying on, in, while he's muted because he's making fun of Ford in there. So... But uh, uh, no, the the funny thing that I like about yeah. that is is no place that, for yeah, he did, you did. Um, but you know, I'd, I'd be willing to bet when that that truck first came out, that was probably as high tech as there was at the time. They were probably that was probably like a, a modern marvel at the time, oh, which is you. interesting because the military always seemed to get the engineering done first. You know. Yeah, exactly. Twenty eight horsepowers. I mean, it's like can you imagine. Like 28 horses. Really? Because that's not too long after the... I mean, that thing drove around with horses still around. That's true. That's true. I wonder if the horses got jealous. I like the fact... Hey, that no thing's got as much pump. power as 28 of our brothers, you know? I like the fact there was no fuel pump, not even a mechanical fuel pump, so they just had to have the gas tank higher than the engine. Yeah, and the fact that he said that all he does is prime it up. Like that in war, though? I don't know if I like that idea in a war. No. Well, yeah, not in war, but I just think that's, like, neat that they, you know, they didn't even have, like, a mechanical fuel pump. So they were just, oh, well, just... Can you imagine how many people probably stalled those trucks on super steep hills if the gas tank was low? Yeah, good point. Oh, yeah. Really and the fact cool. that all it does is take four or five cranks and it starts up, I mean... All these years, a hundred years later, you know, is, that's that's amazing to me. I like that how he talks. Uh, do you have showed it before about some of there's still companies making stuff like mil actual military reproduction tires for those old vehicles for collectors and stuff. And there's companies that, that you know, there's capitalism at work. You know, people making money by making reproduction stuff that's a hundred years old or more. I believe someone asked a question in the video G shared about, uh, like, what about the tires? The tires all look great. And he uh, talked about a company in Ohio that's making the reproduction on military tires. Yeah, I came across a YouTube video the other day of a guy's company who he goes and makes uh, reproduction wheels for, you know, either reproduction Civil War cannons or, you know, uh, you know, original or he he makes original wheels for original Civil War cannons that need wheels. It was a really interesting video. Well, speaking of real interesting videos, why don't we head over to the Patreon platform here if it'll ever load for me, and then we'll uh, chat about 
some of the platforms or some of the projects that are over there. Am I still? Well, I had to. I had to explain Patreon last night. I, I enjoy doing it, but uh, yeah, I had uh, on the podcast last night. I had somebody who's like, I don't know anything about Patreon. I'm like, well, let me tell you. Uh oh, someone got Clover explained. Yeah, you did. How did you explain it then? Well, I always like to start out by telling people, especially people that, that don't know anything because they may hear it, they hear it all the time, support me through Patreon or whatever. And so they, there's this, and, and that's how Patreon started, right? Was, you know, a way to be able to support creators. But it's so much more than that. It's its own platform. So, you know, my when I try to educate people about it, I try to get them not com not completely away from the support aspect, but I want them to understand that you don't just go over there and put your information in and give somebody a couple of bucks a month or something. You know, it's a platform where you can follow and engage and be entertained and informed and all of that good stuff. And and all of that happened on a concise level because you are supporting you know, or if you are supporting rather over there because you don't have to support, you can follow people. And as long as they put public content up, you're able to see that. But if you do support, then you've got all the special content uh, that potentially you can get from creators as well if they if they do that sort of thing. And, you know, the, the beauty of it is it's kind of free for creators to do whatever they want to do. So some, they may just take you money and run. Other ones may give you back more, you know, in, you know, uh, more value than they, than they take in from you, you know, that sort of thing, uh, kind of runs the gamut and it just depends on that creator. But, um, yeah, that's the, that's the first thing I always like to get across is that this is a platform. It's not like PayPal, right? Because people that, that don't know anything about it sort of get this idea. It's like PayPal. They just send you money. And it's like, no, 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 no. Uh, it's so like much it's more than that. Like a service, right? Yeah, yeah, some kind of a paying service, and it's like no, 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 it's so much more than that. So, you know, if you don't care about that, and some people, you know, that support you, they support you to support you. They could care less about the whole platform aspect and and participating and engaging over there and all that, which is sad, but they're well within their their you know prerogative to to do that, of course. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's what I like about it is I just like to you know. I value the platform as much as the ability to get support through the platform. Well, I don't know if anyone else wants to say anything about it, but um, man, that's true. Um, but there's, I mean, I'm not, but it's all valid. Um, I'm going to dig down into mine here, and at the bottom right is where they post now. You can't change this, you can't put it anywhere else. It's down at the bottom right. Uh, the projects that if you're if you go to someone's overview page and they're supporting anyone, this is where it'll be displayed. Oh, if they've got that feature turned on. Oh, and okay. And that and that's something that um, you know, since you're talking about that, I'll throw my two cents out there. If you are a creator, turn that on. For the love of God, turn that on. It shows that you're a part of the community, right? You're you're part of the bigger bigger world. Um, because I think that's a, an that's an added value, it's an added plus in so many ways. Because just like G Webs right now is fixing to walk through this list, I'm assuming. And had he not have it turned on and be showing people, then I mean, you never know. I mean, certain people may find you may find a channel through somebody else's channel, that sort of thing. So it's it's great for cross promotion. Yeah, and you don't have to financially support anybody to follow them either. So you can follow channels. I don't know if it displays your followed ones, but uh, you can you find them up here under posts from the creators you follow or whatever, and uh, you can follow their posts or whatever. So, like Clover said, it's a platform more than a service, and it, it is like YouTube. You know, it can be a function to put your videos on, and you could be focused on podcasting, and you know, you could be using the YouTube as a tool and not focused on the you know the subscriber base on YouTube. There's plenty of projects, plenty of successful projects that do that. Uh, so there's plenty of people that use it just as a function, you know, just a system to uh, allow subscription service. Uh, but you're not limited by that by any means. Same as YouTube, you know, you have 
tabs on YouTube that lots of people don't bother with the community tab and and the channels that you follow. And again, you can show your support for channels and you can uh, establish um, links to channels like Cloverset so that someone who's browsing your page and appreciates what you're doing can see what influences and what you support. Um, so there's people that use the platforms that way that explore the platforms. And as someone who comes over to a Patreon, that's someone who understands that they're as a capitalist, their wallet is a weapon and they're deciding because they've either experienced it or they're about to, you know, they're, they're decide, just de deciding uh, to support things financially, potentially. So again, if you're using the platform and you're being creative with it and you're using the tools that they have, uh, there's polls, there's um, live stuff. Like Clover said, you can hide stuff behind a paywall so that only certain levels of patronage or something can see it. And there's certainly people that go with that strategy. Um, but again, you can, if you only did that, then people are only going to be told, here's something that you could see, here's something that you could see. They're not going to really see anything that you've done, just the amount of stuff that you've done. Uh, and again, you can look at somebody who's super successful or at an extreme example and get discouraged, or you can look at the amount of people that are using the platform and the growth of the platform and be encouraged. And uh, yeah, I definitely want people to to uh, consider it as uh, uh, if you're not or if you're only barely using it to uh, devote some time to it once in a while. <clears throat> so we'll just go through and uh, maybe I'll do it this way. Who all is supporting Matt? show of hands or whatever, we'll do it that way. See which ones were jointly. I, I did for a long time, but I, I've kind of gone through some of the smaller creators, but I did for a long time, yeah. About I usually throw... What did you say, Dennis? I was going to say, uh, you're talking about just specifically on Patreon, supporting yeah. that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you go with uh, throw people money on PayPal uh, on whatever basis and uh, just directly to PayPal. Yep. Right. That that and I also throw super chats, even though I know like that's not always a good thing, but sometimes it can be a good thing if you want them to, you know, read a specific comment or something. I mean, if the person is trying to raise funds, then super chat isn't the most effective way because one, they're going to take a thirty percent bite of it, and it's going to YouTube who hates our property, um, but it's facilitating. You know, the giant audience and the functionality of the Super Chat, everything's super easy. So by doing it, you're encouraging other audience to potentially participate. They didn't even know what a Super Chat was, perhaps, or they didn't think about clicking the button. So there's some value to Super Chat on YouTube. I'm not going to encourage it on my stuff. I guess there's probably a Super Chat now. Hey, did you say uh, Matt or Mac? M-A-T. Never enough to ammo. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm still supporting him. I thought you said, I thought you said first you said Mac. I know, I still yeah. support never. Yeah, I was support in military arms channel for a while, and then I stopped when he got way bigger than he needed my dollar or whatever, and he doesn't need my support over here. This I'm really trying to amplify projects that, you know, might not be discovered or whatever, except for Matt and Yankee. Maybe they've got their own established base. Anybody else throw money at Yankee? Yeah, I am. You know, he's got the, the TMYP project or whatever is all through the Patreon, so at that. Gun channels is because whenever we were doing the Daily Gun Show, um, everybody wanted to have a separate thing so we could make money on the Daily Gun Show, and then well, that never happened. So I had two Patreons. You can have as many Patreons as you want, by the way. Just log in and log out. You can have as many Patreons as you want. I guess I have three. Uh, I only really use the two. Uh, the other one, I think, is sitting at like $7, and the Gun Channels one is like at 100 The goal with the Gun Channels one is to raise enough funds to have a full-time person to moderate and He's sort of, uh, what's the word, not a butler, but like that person who's sitting in the front of a hotel that kind of knows everything that's going on. Um, to have somebody like that for gun oh, channel. Con con concierge. Yeah, for the gun community. So, you know, at some point we had uh, Jim James for a while. Um, you know, there's potential people out there that could handle a gig like that. So, you know, it's not something that I'm focusing on, but if anybody wants to participate, please do. And all the funds at this point go to keeping the servers going and that kind of thing. Uh, the Guru Podcast, again, is just the third one. Uh, Travis, of course, uh, Caliber Corner, and uh, he joins in on lots of live conversations and runs um, hit or miss for Night Strike. We got Clover Tack, who's in the chat right now. We got Ghost, who's in the chat right now. We got Outlaw, and I know he's back and forth, you know, but uh, pretty consistent when he was doing his chats and 
I know he's striving. He's coming back. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, he's got. He's coming back. He's just busy working a lot. He's getting a lot of hours in. He's busy. Uh, he's going to be getting internet hooked up here in the next couple of weeks again. So. Then we got Alan Anchor, uh, a, a manual company, right? So she's not really putting this out there as a way to create income as much as a way to support other projects and a member of gun channels and everything. And then uses the Patreon like some other company, well, at least one other company we know of that. Uh, is there, you know, using the Patreon platform as a way to support projects she values. We got Hosh doing the ham radio project, um, which is, you know, he touches guns once in a while and he's, you know, aware of what's going on. But, uh, you know, doing that in a whole nother way. And if you're looking for some insight on how to, uh, I guess, you know, run the perks or do the, the perk levels and stuff, you might have some insight or you might glean something from his setup there. Uh, gun tube, where are you at now? 50 bucks? Yeah, it's gone down. Oh. I support gun tube on Patreon. Yeah. Well, yeah. Wish it's for fishing, so kick the shit out of it. How many posts you got over here? Let's give them a... Uh... I, I need to get more posts, and that's just, just the end. But I have, to have, I have to have actually something to post, unfortunately. Oh, well, every week that goes by, you can be doing an update on what you're trying to do, what you want to get going. But, yeah, look around, see what other I'll people... Lots and lots of potential on this place. Uh, 50,000 creators. So 50,000 people with their hand out for e-bagging. And 1 million suckers come along to Patreon and hand out $150 million a year. All that number is on the internet. You can go verify it. So $150 million a year is more than $10 million a month. So 50 million pan e-pan e handlers stick their hand out so they don't have to work for a living. 50,000 of them. Sucker one million people into dropping ten million dollars on those fifty thousand. So Clover has a lot of uh, good ideas for that thing, and could probably profit off of it or uh, fund a project with the uh, potential that's there. Uh, Black Gun Matters, Taj Maj doing his thing, and uh, he uses this to some extent, but he also uses uh, the GoFundMe. Uh, we've got Kevin who's, uh, again, not really using this to its full extent, but um, definitely want to support him. He's boots on the ground. We've got James Cleta, one of my favorite podcasts out in New Jersey. Uh, again, not really, I don't think he's doing much with his. And one of our goals is to you know, keep these conversations going, to give people some insight as to how to you know, get more than just me supporting you, I guess. So um, second is for everyone, Tony Simon. Just posted the uh, cartoon of doing Tony's cartoon today. Uh, everybody, I think, is probably familiar. Tony jumps in on these two A workshops quite a bit. Uh, he's fighting off a cold or something right now. Got Gizzard. He's working. Probably keeping a nuclear reactor from blowing up right now. But uh, obviously, kicking out content at a totally different level than like the next guy, Ken Blanchard, or what Tony's doing right. But again, our buck is still supporting it. That same crisp dollar bill that comes out of our wallet and goes into the PayPal. Comes out on the other end for Gary, right? I uh, got Ken, grandfather of podcasting and, and keeping 2A media going. Um, has a bit of stuff going on on Patreon. I think he's there is also kind of inspiration and mentoring. So uh, always have an invite out for Ken. We got Rick, who was in here a little earlier, wasn't he? And uh, he's got his two podcasts a week that he's kicking out. Uh, Liberty Doll. Midnight Range, Logan, um, Masasho. I don't know how you say that. You guys know about this guy? Blind yes, one of, one of my favorite YouTube channels. Exactly. I'm actually plugging him because I'm trying to get his ear so I can do an interview with him. But, uh, yeah, I think it's neat that he's just kicking out what I find to be interesting videos because he doesn't put a lot of flash and sizzle into it, just down and dirty talking about the gun. And, uh, yeah, he's blind, so that adds another level because he's got a whole another level of insight to these things, a level of uh, uh, knowledge of them that other people oh, yeah. can read it. He really seems to know his stuff. I really enjoy that guy's content. And then, of course, Skip Tactical, who's uh, kicking butt in a whole other way as a female instructor and active duty Air Force mom and advocate, right? So those are some of the people that are using it, and I encourage you to go to my channel and scroll down and and look at those each of those not all of them are hot rods they're not all kicking butt some of them like yankee are just doing exceptionally well and uh learn from each of these and then browse around a little bit you click this little thingy here 
and type in gun. See what's out there. You could type in something else you might be interested in. If you're interested in a camera or a computer or I guess people are interested in other things. Um, but Patreon's not that uh, difficult to a platform, right? There's there's lots of things you can do, but there's not all that many building blocks. So there's like there's a lot of potential to it. Anybody else want to throw anything in there about Patreon? Is Patreon the preferred service of YouTubers over? Uh, I, does anyone do like the GoFundMe or Indiegogo, or is that just for like actual projects, not for creating? Exactly. The, the GoFundMe is sort of a little hybrid because before the Patreon kind of established as a subscription type of funding, um, the GoFundMe allows sort of a large project that takes doesn't really have an end goal. It just keeps going, uh, where the Indiegogo and the Kickstarter are more project-oriented with a finite campaign. So three months usually is the longest. 30 days is what they prefer, I think. And, uh, you know, you have an end date and you usually have a project or a system or a service or something that, as a result of it, where GoFundMe can be like a continuing education or a, an ongoing podcast. I think they have a little bit more open parameters for their projects over there. But yeah, Patreon, as far as a, if you want to call it like a subscription or a um, um, monthly um support type of thing because they're not all monthly you can do chapters so if you're writing let's say or you're doing like a, a series you could you know per episode or per per chapter um and then that could be on a you know as the as the artist has time type of thing you know and a and teacher who has time in the summer or a seasonal worker who has time you know and this is a way to supplement so there might be projects that are that come in spurts and it's a way for, to fund those where, you know, you don't necessarily want to try to fundraise, you know, all the money for an entire book when you know it's going to take you four years or something to actually write it. That makes sense. All right. So let's see. What are they talking about on the YouTube side over here? They're talking about YouTube monetization. I don't even know why. If you're a gun guy, you know, you're not going to get monetized. Is that something we should... Well, is, I think there's still some that are monetized, right, that have changed their content and in such a way that they still are monetized. And it's hard to But as a new channel on the YouTube platform with the focus on firearms, I think it's unrealistic to think you're going to do anything to maneuver to get a successful project. I mean, potentially right. you could do something anti-gun. That would probably take off and get all kinds of money. But, you know, valid. I don't think there's any way to to create something strictly gun. There's probably some way to exploit. You could probably melt them or microwave them or stick them in blenders or something like that that would catch an audience. But we talked earlier about this concept of, you know, valuing the community that you've got, valuing the uh, conversation that you have with the people that appreciate what you're doing. Uh, whether it's focused on a segment of the community or a area of interest or a, a region and uh, you know the that concept versus trying to appeal for the largest and uh, audience and the biggest numbers which uh, you become beholden to the recipes right you become beholden to the strategies that work to accomplish those and that typically tends to be your plain vanilla flashy all flash and no sizzle or whatever the term is. Hmm. Yep. All right. Well, so more dead air. Uh, how long we've we been going? When did we start this? An hour ago? Yeah, about an hour. Uh, yeah. Two hours ago, about. Oh, oh was it? 40 minutes, yeah, maybe? two hours ago. Because I came in an hour into it because I'm still at work. Well, this is two hours and 38 minutes if I'm right now. So, if I go like this, um, maybe I have to hit live. But if you hit live and then you just try to drag this thing back. Oh, no. Yeah, two hours, right? 154.
That's why I try to figure it out. Wow. You, you can't doesn't seem out. like doesn't seem like we've been on that long. Yeah, it doesn't. <clears throat> um, let's see. So the con the subjects we we're going to talk about today: your gun rights policy conference. Anybody want to say anything else about that one? I really want to go. Yeah, I want to go too. I will go. I'm not sure how at this point, but I will. You got about 60 something days, 70 days, make it happen. And then some of that's travel. Uh, then we got AMCON coming up the day before. And then we got uh, uh, 2A. Well, I didn't do the 2A podcast schedule. So I definitely wanted to put Tony in there. I know his podcast come out on Tuesdays. Um, and then I was going to put Liberty Dolls Friday show on there. What other shows? Oh, Skip does a show on Thursdays, right? That would be worth putting on there. She does that on the regular now. Um, Maj does some sort of Monday with Maj, I think. He's always at the same time as Clover on Instagram. Yeah, he corks me on purpose. Do you um, post that one, or is that some Patreon one? The Instagram. Uh, which on Instagram? No, that's our that gets posted replay over on YouTube. But I mean the um, live part. If we put it on a live schedule, it's not a Patreon only live session or something around Instagram. So anybody on there can see it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it stays on Instagram for the twenty four hours or whatever, and then by the time the before the twenty four hour runs out, I've got a replay of it over on uh, YouTube by then. So it's forever on the internet. Well, I'm talking about the schedule on gun channels, though. Uh, I'm thinking right. about putting right. more stuff on there than just the things that people post on gun channels, so that oh. you know, valid stuff can be heard or whatever. If it's on a re you know schedule, because some stuff just happens when it happens, but yeah, you know, no, it's regular schedule. Yeah, you put a link to the thing, and if someone's on a phone, they can click on that link, and they'd be on your Instagram channel. Or if they're just on a phone, a computer, they can you know say, oh, okay, I see. I just pick up my phone and watch it. Right. So again, there's Skip on Thursday, there's uh, Liberty on Friday, and uh, Tony on Tuesday, and Maj on Monday. What else is uh, a regular regular podcast? Good Lord, Ghost is Tuesday. Well, stuff we don't already have on the schedule. Oh, stuff we don't already have, okay. Um, hmm. Yuda doesn't do any kind of podcast, does he? Nothing I'm aware of, no. No, uh, he'll jump on people's, but he doesn't do it himself. Fit and Fire. Fit and Fire does Sunday, and I'm not real sure what other day. Hmm. Yeah, there's Places. that the Trigger guy, and then what about Daily Shooter? Does he do a regular one, or is that just like Jared when he, when he does them? Um, recently, the last few months, it has not been on a regular basis. That's, that's you know. Uh -huh. So. And that's frustrating. So maybe we'll have just a list of regular podcasters that aren't on a schedule also. Yeah. Zeke, I don't know if Zeke's on a regular schedule, but... He's not on a regular schedule either. I'm supposed armed to meet him, you know, him tomorrow, actually. Armed and feminine? She doesn't do a podcast. She's working on starting one, but she it's not a regular podcast that she does. Okay. I know that the... Uh, one of the people at uh, host the uh, AMCON, Amanda Suffolk, and her brother do uh, a syndicated radio show. Uh, I don't know how to put that on the schedule. We guess we could put the time it airs, I guess, and then, you know, that'd now, be like, hey, listen to a radio, just like we do with Yoder and come and talk it on Sundays, you know, hey, turn on a radio. Did you mention Ken? Ken Blanchard? No, I totally forgot about his, but yeah, that's another reason I wanted to yeah. make the schedule expand out because, you know, it's offering the option to bring into gun channels is like saying hey why don't you support me on patreon to some people it's in one ear out the other right like or value your own patreon page same thing in your one out the other right so um yeah if, if gun channels isn't their thing who cares it doesn't have to be right we can still help promote the show and create some backlinks and again if someone happens to be browsing or something and they type in thursday firearms related podcast if we can help them come up So I'll work on that, and I'm also going to make a form. I don't think I'm going to do it now because it's freaking hot. But uh, um, 
I'll probably end it here, but I was going to do a Google form and make a way for people when I send out that email to everybody and let them know they're invited to the show. Uh, have a link on that form to, or a link on that email to a form that if they can't show up, they can leave a remark or a link or something. You know, hey, I can't get there because I'm too busy, but here's what's important this month, or you know, whatever. Here's what's important this month, and uh, maybe we get some. Who cares if you know? The, the goal isn't to con or get or force anybody to get into a room together. If they don't want to get into a room together, they don't need to. But if we can facilitate getting information out monthly um you know some things aren't just news stories right some things are like remember the gun rights policy conference is coming up in three months so you can put it on your schedule remember that three months after that is shot show you know are we gonna be drifting and just you know encounter these things uh, is like waves or do we got a motor or do we got sales do we have intent are we going somewhere with the things that we're creating you know are we building bleachers or are we building ballot boxes But again, it's getting super hot. Let's see what the temperature is in Tucson. <laughs> Too hot. It was only 100. It was 107 yesterday. I guess it's only going to. It's maxing out at 105 right now, so it must be getting cloudy. Oh, it's it's balmy. Well, yeah, it's a bit balmy. Not as bad as 115. That is definitely a step worse because it would be 97 in my house instead of 80 something. Oh, uh, 115. But uh, with that. Thanks, everybody, for showing up live. Uh, a bunch of people showed up on the chats out there on the uh, Gun Channel side. GunChannels.com is a community. We built it six years ago. It's not supposed to be the new Facebook. It's not supposed to be better or do anything faster. It's supposed to be a place that's ours, that nobody else owns, that we can have a discussion about firearms, a discussion about the Second Amendment. And if you uh, are creating content and you want to collaborate and network and share, share skill set, if you have stuff that you can offer to others so that they can do more, the uh, thing I learned when I was a kid, together we each accomplish more is teamwork, right? It, we are capitalists. We are individuals. doesn't mean we can't work together. We don't have to work together like freaking communists, but we are better as a team. So Gun Channels is just a place to foster that, those kind of conversations. If it's not perfect, make it better. Make it more towards perfect. If it's not going to work for you, then go build a better one. For crying out loud, it's six years old. This is the internet. There should be two better gun channels by now. Why not, right? I mean, I built it with myself. Like, what the hell? Get three people together. Pay two people to put one together, and it's got to be better than what I built, right? So go create conversation and go get us people motivated it only takes three to eleven percent to affect change so we only have to talk to a relatively few gun owners anyway thanks to the people on gun channels who pay for it and keep it online who keep the community and the family together night strike uh helping to keep the back end together ghost and clover keeping the word out about it dead horse running the shows tremendous effort thank you all uh, for jumping into the show today to keep this conversation going. It's six years old. It started with a bunch of people that just used to chat. We used to, to sit around and we all realized we're sitting on some really neat bleachers and uh, we watched a whole bunch of people stand up and resist potential tyranny. And then we saw them all sigh a collective and sit down and go back to business as usual and get distracted by the shiny little bits and the engravings and the coatings. And, uh, you know, very regularly we see issues i mean are we delusional something's going to happen here that's going to catch and we're going to see an attempt to restrict our rights again we're going to see attempts to infringe uh, they're getting more brash if they're just pounding at the chest at the at the ballot at the soapbox so uh, this is an attempt this every second matters project is an attempt to keep a conversation alive again it's not the conversation it's not the only conversation is not the best way to have a conversation, but it's uh, an attempt to keep on going. So thanks to all the people who keep Every Second Matters going. And uh, I'm going to quit saying thanks. Get off your asses and go change the fucking world.